So welcome back. I'm excited to make this video today talking about training men's voices, which seems so overwhelming to so many people, but it really doesn't have to be. And I've got my amazing friend, amazing teacher here, Justin Peterson, and he is going to introduce himself for you, tell, tell you kind of what he's into, and we'll talk about men's voices and training. Well, thank you so much. I'm so excited to be here with you today, and I'm so glad we had the time to do this. Yeah. Um, I am a voice teacher uh, here in Boston, Massachusetts. Um, I have been teaching voice since about 1997. I would say well since maybe 10, 12 years ago. <laughs> <laughs> now I've How started to get better at this that? thing, right? <laughs> I'm like, let me give all the money back to all my first and second year students. Here you go. <laughs> But uh, no, it's been uh, it's been a great uh, experience. I also coach students um, with My College Audition, which is a uh, company, and we help prepare high school students for music theater auditions for college. So that's a lot of fun, which gets me more into the musical realm rather than the technical pedagogical uh, realm. And I also have a very uh, uh, acute interest in historical pedagogy and its application and um, sort of availability to a modern uh, teaching audience. And I try to sort of promulgate the wisdom of the 20th century, 19th century, 18th century pedagogies to a 21st century audience uh, yeah. through my blog. And also with recently a new project that I've undertaken is a podcast with Brian Lee. And Brian Lee and I have the Voice Culture Podcast where we sort of sit around like, I don't know, two old biddies talking about the vocal world and just, you know, maybe maybe counter to a lot of the uh, sort of more, conf not conformist, but sort of community-based ideas of thinking about singing. And we kind of go, yes, but look at this over here that's so interesting. So we're always kind of on the fringe on the, the Malcolm Gladwell outliers. Yeah. Uh, oh, cool. What's going on in pedagogy or look at these ideas. Um, so we just want to share some of the great literature, talk about it, have a good time and uh just I enjoy voice that, stuff so yeah it's I'm brand new yeah it's oh, brand new excellent. yeah yeah yeah, yeah. Excellent. the culture ha comes from both brian and i have a very strong feeling about the word cultivation and uh versus production and we sort of tie that to the 19th century because it it is a sort of a semantic phenomenon in the 19th century that we see early 19th century sources talk about voice culture cultivation voice cultivation and then as we move from an agrarian society to a more industrial society, pedagogical texts in the 19th century started to talk about voice production. Or, interesting. So it's really interesting to see how farming and industrial revolution affected the zeitgeist and how people were conceptually thinking about the voice. So we move from more of a, a cultivation model, a plant model, to more of a factory sort of model. like. Everything has to be done like that parts. That has and... huge implications for the way people are thinking about their totally, voice. Totally, totally. There are many authors who who are not so wild about the uh, 19th century shift because it, they believe that it did lead to a lot of self-consciousness. Because once we started looking at plates and diagrams of the voice, singers got it in their minds visually. Oh, I can see it. Now let me mess with it. So that had never occurred before that time because people really didn't have that anatomical knowledge. So it mm. does sort of lend to this psychological need to think, well, now I can see it. Let me see if I can mess with it. And right. so it can lead to that sort of like mechanistic, let me control things directly kind of mentality. Right. So, and that that's very interesting, um, just in perspective too, because people can get in their their own head about about voice so much. Yeah. And I mean, I know, again, as a from a therapist perspective, you know, I got my two hats. Mm. I when I look at somebody's stroboscopy, if they're having a voice problem, I can kind of I visualize when I see it on the exam, like, what are the pieces that might be going wrong? Mm. But you're right, I don't necessarily I mean, I educate the patient as to what's going on with their voice but like right. then when we get into therapy i'm not constantly talking about like okay you know now the vocal fold has to do this you know we have to right. get there another way right right so indirectly yeah which is my big yeah so my i carry the banner for indirect pedagogy mm -hmm. all the time yeah. like getting a result without the student knowing 
that that's occurring and yeah. and being able to to sort of keep what's good and sort of massage maybe what's dysfunctional into yeah. a better working condition yeah right yeah. Well, let's let's get into men now. Oh boy, men, men, men. men. Uh, <laughs> I know it's like we need a we need Nelson Eddy on the uh, horse riding through <laughs> stout-hearted men. <laughs> right. I mean, people are so. I, I keep hearing it over and over whenever I'm with other singing teachers, how overwhelming it seems to many teachers, and our our field is still more predominantly women than men mm. as teachers. And I and it seems like people just are very uncertain and feel like there's something vastly different about yeah. about the larynx. And and what's interesting is physiologically the mechanism is largely the same. There are some differences in thickness of tissue and angles and sizes of things, but mm. the fundamental mechanism is largely the same. It's largely a unisex system. Mm. And and I and so I'm just interested, first of all, in your take on maybe what why you think that some other teachers think this is so overwhelming or so, you know, dangerous. Or... I think it's because the male top voice is such a mystery for so many okay. people, I think, maybe. Um, how is that happening? Right. How is that male top voice? happening and it all obviously is style dependent because that's going to be different depending on the style sure. um but i think the sort of maybe and i'm going to please don't think i'm not gen you know i'm being unfavorable here but i'm generalizing here that many women will sort of approach the top in a classical way in a very different than a man approaches his top in a classical way okay uh in terms of what's going on there functionally and i think women feel a certain thing and hear a certain sound in a top in their top voice that men don't necessarily uh, use the same, let's say, registration or vocal fold uh, behavior as they go from the top into the top of the voice. And so right. I think that's where that confusion maybe rests. Um, I mean, very simplistically, I like to think that male voices are trained in a very similar way that you would train a female belter or a female um, musical theater singer Okay. Yeah. in terms of the engagement of the vocalis muscles Okay. and, and what's going on there. Um, it, it, in a classical sense, no. I mean, it, it, it does for a man to sing in a more lightened head production in the top would be seen as uh, unstylistic, right? Sure. Right. It would be a counter to the style, and absolutely. Uh, and if you depending on the audience you're in front of, they may boo. <laughs> 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 you are cheating, right? Yeah, exactly. So I think it's yeah. it's figuring out that upper voice, figuring out how it progresses seems to be another. Uh, bit of confusion. How does that upper register? How does that upper voice develop in a man um, mm -hmm. versus uh, you know maybe a, a female student? Because right. it does change very yeah. much so. And what's interesting? It, it's interesting that you mentioned that that connection between like belting versus the way the way a classical male singer might approach that those higher notes. That right. like as a, a, a I'm a person who's always dealt a lot with contemporary commercial music. Mm -hmm. So, and I've always been a belter as well. And I don't know if that kind of just makes me a little bit more comfortable, yeah. a little bit with that high TA, sorry, thyroarytenoid yeah, yeah. Um, engagement. Sure. Whereas if for, for singers who have really spent their whole lives in classical, you're right, that, that would be very, very different. Yeah. Um, and so when, and men go into the top, there's there's so much potential for disaster <laughs> in the top <laughs> because of what's happening. Um, I I can tell tell uh, my own tale and uh, uh, anecdotally, for me I had a lot of chest register on the bottom after puberty. It is normal for many cis male singers uh, who change, um, and it's like a new toy. You're just like woohoo! I've got this brand new thing and let me play with it and this is so fun and. I will say this though, I think this is uh, some implications for, for teachers too. I did mourn my lost voice before puberty. So mm -hmm. sometimes when you have a male student who comes in and the voice has changed or is changing, it's important I think for us to not um, maybe put too much emphasis on what's been lost, I'll acknowledge it and say, yes, it's changed, but now you're gonna have something different. Cause yeah. there can be that sort of emotional like, but I sang so much better when I had this other voice, you know? Yeah. So there's that sort of first piece that we have to deal with. But sure. I had so much chest in my voice because the, of the type of music I sang. I didn't start in classical music. I started in country music. Okay. Uh, yeah. So that was my go-to. Um, and 
what sort of happened for me was that the lower register got very much uh, very developed and very strong. And it made a big, robust sound. And that was that sort of masculine, you know, classical sound. Yeah. Um, and then I never figured out what happened in the top of the instrument pedagogically for myself. So everything up to about F sharp, or G, that was it. And then that was the end of the game. So mm. that was all fire root note activity. But then what I would do for those sort of up, most uppermost pitches, like F sharp, G, I would go into this very heavy vocal cover. This very, what um, I think uh, Ken Bozeman says, active uh, active covering or active manipulation to sort for, of get for people who are unfamiliar with that how would you describe covering oh, oh boy well it's definitely acoustic it's definitely something you do in your throat um and it it feels heavy physically it feels uh uh i would say from my experience it felt very pressurized it mm -hmm. felt like there was an intense amount of subglottic pressure below my vocal folds mm -hmm. uh, as i went up into the top um, there's a very much a change of timbre, a change of color, because what we're, I think what we're trying to do, I mean, anatomically is we're trying to stabilize the laryngeal position, uh, because as we go higher, that larynx wants to rise. And so for the male singer who wants to sort of m master that, we don't want that sort of gross, you know, ah, necktie kind of thing where you're feeling like you're choked, right? So yeah. we tend to want to uh, actively sort of manipulatively pull it down. And so that's sort of how what I think of as a cover or, yeah. a, bit, or a really dramatic cover. Um, and some people like that sound. Yeah, that's true. Right? Yeah. I mean, some people listening to it would go, oh, that's exciting. That's really, you know, dramatic. Um, in my throat, I didn't feel either of those things. <laughs> it was dramatic, but maybe in the wrong way. Um, it didn't feel supple. Were you taking lessons at the time? Yes, yes, okay. oh, yes, yes. And so your teacher maybe wasn't addressing upper register? Or? Correct, correct. Yeah, it, it was not really a part of the pedagogical world that I yeah. had been a, a part of. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't even know as late as grad school what a head voice was. I mean, I didn't, uh -huh. I didn't think I had one. I thought okay. I, cause I just knew my chest voice and mm -hmm. that's the only range and register I knew. And I had a lot of success in it because it was long ranged and you can sing a lot of music in a long range chest voice. Sure. Sure. You know, there's yeah. a lot you can do. Um, but ultimately the, the voice rebelled because it was being used functionally in a way that wasn't serving the totality of the holism of the instrument. Right. It right. wasn't sort of a full, full view of everything. It was sort of maybe short sighted. Yeah. So, um, yeah, I think for me, it was very easy to do. And I was a good imitator. Mm, I could imitate okay. really well. And so you can, when you can imitate, you can pass a lot of inspection with things <laughs> because, yeah. because people you're, you're sounding as you should sound. Mm -hmm. It's very, it's very, as, um, my, one of my favorite authors is Daniel Bloom Habatka. And she talks about this idea of a corporate sound. Mm, it's very oh. corporate in the sense that it's like, yep, that's exactly what we want to see on. That's right. It's very that's just it. corporate. That's it. Mm -hmm. But it sounds like that came as a at at a mechanical cost to it you. It did. It did. It did. And, Absolutely. And, and I find and and I mentioned this when we were sort of prepping and talking a little bit um, as we were getting ready for this. Like, I feel like I have to sell young men on developing their upper register. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. <laughs> yes. Like, they somehow are still perhaps in that falsetto mindset where it's like wrong or a right. fake sound or something like that or girlish yeah right yeah it, it can invoke a lot of gender kind of discomfort that's true that's true yeah yep. and so you know i i i feel like what you're coming to now is you're going to discover <laughs> this whole other half to your voice right right and now so I'm, I'm sure you know i've certainly seen a lot of folks like this you so you get a new student they're mm -hmm. stuck in chest. Yes. Now what? Well, there are so many ways that I kind of come at this issue. One is the psychological, mm. which is a big part of it. Sure. It's the, it's the psychological um, barrier that may be erected. Uh, I have to get over that barrier or I can't teach them. Sure, you know, sure. they, if the mind won't allow me to do it, I, there's nothing I can do. I can have every exercise in the book, but if the, if the person is just, you know, absolutely stuck in the, in their thinking about this, I, I can't do anything. I can't okay. teach them. I just can't yeah. teach them. Um, it depends on the age of the person when they come in, how old they are, how close have they been to the, the change of their voice, mm -hmm. uh, in terms of, um, 
development of the two port sort of register sounds. Um, and then from there, it's physical because one of the things that uh, accompanies much of the upper register work for many men is constriction because it's new, the vocal folds may not be used to that behavior. Sure, and so sure. the foreign sort of um, function sends a message to the throat, uh oh, something's wrong. And it immediately wants to sort of clamp down on that. Yeah. So over time, being able to sort of very gradually work the upper register in a, in a, in a way that doesn't make the throat constrict is a lot of work with the register at, to begin with. Mm -hmm. And yeah. that's why I, I really like the idea that Herbst and Speck have talked about in their paper about adducted falsetto versus abducted falsetto. Mm -hmm. So I try to come at it from those two different um, functions. Ah. Uh, um, so I, I try to get the falsetto uh, to be breathy and it's okay that it's breathy uh, at the beginning. I, I'm like, I encourage, I don't want them to try to go for a clean, clear sound. If it's gonna, yeah. if it's gonna constrict, yeah. I'm just saying to the throat, hey, this is how you sing high notes, squeezing their throat, you know, <laughs> and it's like, I don't want to send that message to their body right. that high notes equal, oh, squeeze your throat. Mm -hmm. So um, I sort of look for that more breathy, hooty falsetto. And I look for it to be dark, because the darkness tells me the acoustic is the soft palate being there's more room inside, because we know when the sound has a particular timbre quality, it tells us what is it the uh, inside what the outside, what is it? The inside of the vowel is the outside of the throat or, or the in, inside of the throat is the outside of the vowel. Was that like to say? Okay. Yeah, the, the vowel that we hear on the outside is the throat on the inside. So if it's obviously warm and, and, and more dark, that's obviously a particular configuration of the vocal tract. I mean, this acoustics, we, I think that's sort of settled science. Uh, and then if it's brighter or thinner or, or, or more constricted, that's gonna have a sound too in the acoustic of the voice. Mm -hmm. So being able to parse that out from the folds is a big part of that as well. Like, is that the throat? Is that the vocal folds? Um, so I do encourage that sort of uh, hootier, darker sound because at least then the throat has more room inside in hopefully a relaxed way right. than a more eh, kind of high, more pinchy thing, which, mm -hmm. is the, which is the default for a lot of guys when I start to open up that upper register. Yeah. I really find it. I, I totally agree about that breathiness at first. Yeah. Cause, and sometimes it's the only way that, of course, that, that they're going to be able to find it, yep. which is fine. We're just figuring out how can we release that thyroarytenoid muscle? How totally. can we have the body say, <laughs> right. oh, this doesn't have to be contracted the whole time. This can, right. this can release. Right. Turn yeah. it off. Yeah. Right. And then Alpha, can, yeah. Yeah. it's still sound there and it's light and that that's what it's supposed to be. Exactly. And this is where that psychological piece, you know, you talk about comes in. It's like, I'll see this look on their face kind of like, that's not right. <laughs> like, that's what you want. Yes, that's perfect. Right. Exactly. And they're like, what? Oh, I fought this for years. I yeah. fought this for years because I had classical training. And so when I would make those sounds, I'm like, that's not real singing. And everyone in the room would go, oh, no, we beg to differ. That yeah. sounds actually really good. Mm -hmm. So it's that idea of how we perceive ourselves in sound mm -hmm. versus how other people are receiving the sound that we're getting. Oh, yeah. It's huge. And, and getting a, a student to trust that Mm -hmm. is so important and yeah. it's just another aspect of them of their voice I, it's yeah. like that's just another thing you can do uh it's it's so it's so foreign mm -hmm. and students are so kinesthetically bereft because they have nothing to compare it to right right have, there's no it's like they're i i used to say it's like you're you're in on mars and you're looking for landmarks you're like, yeah. where, where am I at? How do I, I get my bearings? There's no yeah. Starbucks. What do I exactly. do? Exactly. <laughs> exactly. Is there a Duncan? Can I at least get a Duncan? Right. Yeah. 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 I mean, yeah. Right. And it's a neighborhood. I was still kids. It's a neighborhood you've never visited. And so yeah. it's just important for you to get to know the neighborhood and yeah. what's and drive around. You don't have to live there, yeah. right, <laughs> but I at least right. want you to drive around and know where, where the t parts of the town are. Right. Exactly. And I take it from an exercise physiology point of view too because that's mm -hmm. like that's something i've been interested in for decades you know and mm -hmm. i and i was mm -hmm. fortunate enough to be able to take a grad school class in in exercise physiology which oh, i think really yeah. set my perspective you know and we know that there are some differences about how the voice works versus limb muscles so let well you know that's 
outside the scope of this conversation, but just knowing that like, I can explain it to them like, you you can't exercise your whole body only with contraction, right? You have to do mm. some stretching too. If you don't if you don't do the stretching, like then you get locked in. And oh, totally. Bodybuilders have, have this problem. Movement. Right. Bodybuilders have this issue. Yeah. So part of my sell is that you have to practice this part of your voice in order to get this part of your voice to function better. Totally. You totally know, agree. And, and that usually then makes sense because a lot of people at least have have some experience with exercise, right? Even if it's not a high level, you know, yes. they kind of they can conceptualize that maybe a little bit better. For for guys, sport is a great entree mm. to understanding this process. I found the students who do sport are so much more uh, mentally able to go with it because mm. if they understand that we're going to the gym. Yeah. And we're going to do stuff in the gym, all we're going to, you know, you, you, bodybuilders have leg day, arm day, right. back day, you know, it's not all the same thing all the time. We, we go around, we mix things up, we test things out, we see how things are working. They're much more akin to jump in and, and go with you. Right. I, I always express the upper register's importance in terms of elasticity, muscular elasticity, that if the, if we're just sort of big and bulky all the time, we lose the elasticity of the folds. And I know there's a lot of pedagogies that are predicated on the importance of that upper register. Um, mm -hmm. um, some people um, have called the upper register the guardian angel of the voice, right? <laughs> so it kind of keeps that elasticity because yeah. the tendency will be to want to, I've never met a singer who says, can you make my voice softer? <laughs> I, I mean, yeah. I'm really just, I need to rein it in. I, you know, I mean, everybody gets so excited about volume, right? It's sort of a, sure. it's sort of the blue ribbon for singing. It's the big, um, impressive thing. Thing. This right. happens though with with female belters yes. as well. Yes, like it's very hard if I get um, someone coming in who identifies strongly as a belter. Very very hard mm -hmm. to get them to accept this other half and say, totally. "You're just gonna get really tired if we don't still stretch this this thing out." I mean, the belter and the male singer. It's uh, the arguments are the same. I mean, yeah. it's the same argument. It's just the yeah. same, yeah. It's a different breed of cat, but it's the same thing. <laughs> it's still I mean, a cat. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I kind of like to start with like downward glides yes. and like some ooze mm -hmm. maybe as kind of like yep. first entree before kind of opening up to other vowels. Yep, yep, yep. That's kind of where I, and I, and I, I will personally try and get them to cross over where they could go to chest voice but explore not cross. Yeah. Not oh transitioning yeah. Transitioning to Big voice. time. Like, Big time. Do you have some favorite things you do? Like those are some of my favorite ways to start. So, so in many of my guys who start out with the falsetto work, it's constricted. Mm -hmm. It's constricted. And so I have to, interestingly enough, I do what I call seesaws, which are basically yodels. So oh, I, I, I start those. in the yeah. chest mm -hmm. and I have them just yodel to the top to just get the machine to move to, toggle, uh, yeah. to just toggle because usually the chest voice won't be as constricted you see so i can use the chest voice in its deconstricted phase to teach the falsetto sort of how to come in or the mm -hmm. upper register whatever you want to call it i know what is it talk words about singing are like dancing about architecture right <laughs> it's, like, it's like we'll just have our preferred names and i'm like i don't care what you call it as long as we can both agree on what that is so well, I'm just um reading i just read the other day that that journal of singing article all about the register terminology and right. I'm like, here we go again <laughs> i mean it's some, i mean it's it, choose your favorite words right right um but the toggling for young singers and for men who aren't used to being in a falsetto, at least without a fair amount of constriction, sort of that yodeling can yeah. be a really great way to just let let the larynx move, leave it yeah. alone, let it let it just do what it's going to do. It's going to be silly. You're going to feel like a Swiss mountain alpine, you yep. know, yodeler. Go to town on it, because because yeah. then from there, once it's sort of freed up, then I can start there. But it's very hard for me to start in the top. Sure. for a guy who's constricted. So yeah. I will usually start in the chest and then toggle into that falsetto to sort of get it to move and to release and to let go. And even when you think about physically what's happening, it's like when, you, when you're when you doing that, it's almost like you're shaking it out, Yeah, you yeah. know, to, to get that. And and of course, plenty of demonstrations so that I'm still just as silly as they are, right? Oh, you know, yeah. I'm not gonna oh, leave yeah. them out hanging out to dry, just being totally. silly by themselves. Totally. You know? And it works, and once it works and they feel it, they go, oh, there oh, I get it. it. Yeah. Because I always feel that one of my big core values is get the student to the place 
to experience it so that then they can codify it in whatever the way they want to. Yeah. Um, one of my favorite authors is Herbert Witherspoon, and he talks about this idea of an olive. If a student or a person has never tasted an olive before, describing the olive, talking about the texture of the olive, talking about the experience of the olive, where it came from, where it was grown, for a student is, is interesting, but until they taste it, they have no experience of what the olive tastes like. So I feel like as a pedagogue, my job is to get them to the behavior. Yeah. Get yeah. them to feel it so that then they can go, oh, right. that's really what my job is. Because um, once they have the experience, they can codify it. And then they go, olive, right? It's right. like, oh, that's an olive. So right. they've had the experience of it. And then they can measure that experience against other experiences that they have. Yeah. Oh, that's a tomato. Oh, that's a, you know, so there's difference of experience. Yeah. So I really find that getting them to the feeling is really so much of the, of the work. Yeah. And then go, oh yeah, that's great. That's it. Right. Now I also find that some, some guys need to really stay in that breathy area for a while. Oh yeah. Right? Oh yes. 1000%. 1000%. Mm -hmm. It's a guarantor just to watch that the throat doesn't tighten up. Yeah. Also, too, I really and, and, and I'm crazy, just call me crazy. But I really feel like that opening that uh, posterior cricorytenoid, that is that opener muscle, it, it helps to develop that because I think then you get more finesse between the adduction and the opening of the folds, which can create more dynamic mm -hmm. contrast in mm -hmm. the voice. So that fine tuning of adduction can be so valuable for uh, the messa di voce or for any dynamic shifts or contrasts that might yeah. come into the sound. So if, that, if the adduction is always held in this one particular way and there's no sort of commensurate opening, you sort of get this particularly mm, set dynamic where it's sort of kind of consistently loud, but right. it may not be able to lessen the adduction to get maybe a lighter quality of sound, which is very uh, musically uh, um, exciting. Oh, sure. Sure. You know? So yeah. I, I think that there's some value to be done in that breathy falsetto to get the airway to, whoo, whoo, to just let it open up a little bit more. Yeah. Now, like for you, when do you start to feel like, okay, now I'm going to start leaning toward that more, slightly more adducted mm -hmm. sound with the upper register? Well, for me, it's a throat thing. So if I feel like if I hear the throat is relaxed and soft and easy and the sound is able to be done in that sort of more breathy falsetto, then I sort of start to test it on the eval. So I'll uh, almost exclusively do that well, upper falsetto on ooh. Mm -hmm. uh, and that's really the only vowel that I sort of use. Mm -hmm. uh, and then once it starts to really kind of settle and the, and the body and the brain kind of go, yep, this is what we do. And it's, that, that pattern's been tracked in mm -hmm. and we can do that. Then I start to use the eval to sort of encourage a little bit more adduction in the voice mm -hmm. in that upper register. So we kind of move from that more hoo hoo to more of that we try to sneak up a little bit on adduction. So mm -hmm. now rather than the cra posterior cricorytenoid being the, the leader of the pack, we want to do a little bit of an adduction there. But again, with very light vocalis, mm -hmm. almost very little vocalis activity. Yeah. And then that becomes the new sort of uh, hard one uh, area of the voice to then exercise. Mm -hmm. And so then to get that, um, some people call it a supported falsetto. You might see some uh, pedagogies call it a supported falsetto. Um, maybe Herbst and Speck would call that the adducted falsetto, mm -hmm. uh, where you have um, the vocal folds coming. It's a very singy quality. Mm -hmm. I will often tell the student the difference between this more open, breathy falsetto and this more closed falsetto is that in the open one, it will give itself away because you can't sustain it. Yes. You'll try yes. to sing and you'll just lose all your breath. Whereas in that more adducted uh, setting, you can sing quite long period of time mm -hmm. uh, in that adducted sound. So that sort of is another qualifier that you can notice and go up. Oh, yep. They ran out of breath really, really fast yeah. or, Oh, they're, you know, and it also does that adducted uh, falsetto takes on a more singy quality. Mm -hmm. It begins to sound like a counter tenor, mm -hmm. you know, or, or a mezzo soprano or an alto. It has a pretty quality to it. It's lovely artistically. It yeah. has a nice artistic quality. You're like, Oh, that's so pretty. But again, it's always dependent upon the throat, not rebelling. Do you, when you kind of shift to that E and if they kind of stay in that mm -hmm. breathy area, mm -hmm. do you play around with say volume to try and help them out? Like if yep. they're having trouble kind of finding that spot, do you have mm -hmm. some go-to things that, that you like? 
I do use volume. I also use consonants. So mm -hmm. I will sometimes use a, a g sound, a oh, g yeah. sound, to sort of let them have that feeling of, of closure. G, g, to have the feeling, oh, yep, there it is. There's that nice singing quality. <sighs> if it's sort of let go, I'll, I'll put a consonant on it to help them yeah. get to it. Yeah, because especially but, one of those plosive consonants. Yes. Where they have to build up some pressure beforehand. Yeah. Exactly. Yeah. So I find the g is very helpful. K, not, I mean, yeah, but not as effective, I think, as the g has been for me. Voiceless. So the yeah. g has a voiceless sound. So then you're just kind of accelerating air. So I can see yeah. why that would yeah. be. Yeah. I don't really, yeah, the k has for me is like, eh, I usually prefer the g up mm -hmm. there. And then I'll just do like short, short scales on mm -hmm. gi, you know, seconds, thirds. Mm -hmm. um, the bigger range I get, the more temptation there will be for something else to occur physically. Yeah, sure. So I usually try to like not, uh, keep it to a narrow range and, and work from there so they can really feel what that is. And then like you said, my goal then is to get that upper sound, that adducted falsetto as rangy as it can be. Mm -hmm. Because I think not only does it have a great impact on what the folds are doing, but it also really does work into the infra and suprahyoids. Mm -hmm. And in, as far as what they're doing, um, Husserl and Rod Marling, who were teachers in Germany and, and in the UK in the 60s, uh, really asserted that, and I don't know if this is scientifically proven, but they said that the benefit of it is that you sort of you create this elastic scaffolding of the larynx, of the suspension of the throat, which um, is beneficial so that the uh, puller uppers and the puller downers are working in a sort of collaborative way. Yeah, I see uh, that a lot on the therapy side, where okay. one or the or the other, and I'd say it's more common to see the suprahyoids pulling everything up. Yeah. But I've definitely had a couple of people who, whether mm -hmm. it's speaking or singing voice, there's just this like, from down, down below. Oh, totally. And like, yep. you know, you, they have to, I, I use that word suspension mechanism all the time. Yeah, yeah. Like we're used to it from our car, right? We have the yes. suspension mechanism, right? Exactly. And, and, and so suspension then, doesn't mean frozen. You know what I mean? Exactly. It, I mean, I think exactly. a lot of people think, oh, it doesn't move. I'm like, no, it, it's suspended. I mean, an equilibrium is sort of self-sustaining, but it's going to have a little, you know, even a boat that's stable at sea is going to have some motion, you know? <laughs> we can say the boat is stable, but it's still going to move, you know? Right, yeah, right. Yeah. And I feel like, yeah, we dig for these analogies sometimes to, to really hook into something that, that they can make sense of. Yes. You know, you're right. You couldn't imagine like a boat being like in the water. Set in the water. Right. Yeah. It's it's got to do this. Yes. With Has the water or. <laughs> exactly. Or you're not stable. Right. <laughs> or you right. capsize. Exactly. Right. right. Yeah. Yeah. So that's a big part of it too. You know, it just mm. the that the the suspension of the larynx is is primary, but that the upper register's value cannot just be for the folds. It can be to help to to. Um, be, be uh, aware of what's going on in the suspension of the larynx mm, and that the mm -hmm. larynx is suspended, you know, in that sort of floating place. Yeah. Um, I think what you talked about, though, too, in terms of using smaller scales first, seconds mm -hmm. and thirds, like this ties back into, I just want to kind of bring it back to these are things that we do as singing teachers, right? We know that if we're trying to exercise a new voice quality of any kind, we're usually going to start with a narrower range because right. it's just the body's going to start to make more and more adjustments the farther we go. So anything new, you sort of pull out what that what you would do as a singing teacher. Oh, I'm going to right. start with one, two, three, two, one instead of one, two, three, four, five, four, three, two, one. Right. 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 And so it does make sense. Same thing. But just, you know not getting overwhelmed by the fact that this just happens to be a developing male voice. Totally. And I'm always looking for success in anything that they do. Um, and by sort of, as we said, limiting the, the options, we can get to success, I think, more quickly. I think yeah. there's, there's when you overwhelm the nervous system, ah, they, they don't know what's going on. It's too much yeah. happening. So we can really limit the choice there and, and look for the behavior. And then if it's not there, I, move away. You know, I, for a lot of students, I'm like, okay, fine. The voice, the voice is saying, mm -hmm. no, I don't like. Yeah. And so for me to keep sort of hammering at it is counterintuitive because yeah. like, as I said, I think I always say, I don't want to teach your body that this is how it's supposed to work if it's, okay. not, if it's not working. So yeah. let's move away from it for a time. So, and then I'll maybe come back downstairs to the chest and let that work that yeah. a little bit and then go back up and see, okay, now what's happening up here? Has anything changed? Right. 
Um, so it's it's just sort of a, I guess, a diagnostic process of just yeah. checking on different things as we go, zigzagging. Yeah, and not to shy, and not to shy away from it, you know, no, either. No. Like, okay, so it didn't work. Now, now we come back down. Now we come back to it. And you know, I know from working on male voices in the middle of puberty too. It's like I might have two or three notes here right now. That's that, it. That's, that's right. Okay. That's right. That's Often t we'll find too that the those students you'll get a really good upper register quality higher in the scale. Mm -hmm. So that right, may not kick in whole. You got the gap. Yep. And so they'll. Uh, the, my colleague Brian Lee calls it the missing octave. Mm -hmm. <laughs> Where's that? Just like that range cu cuts off, and it's like there's nothing past that point. So uh, you know, Noel and I. I think yeah. I told you Noel and I are doing this thing on on. The voice in puberty and in in looking at some of that like cooksey's work on yep. on the development of the male voice he refers to it as blank spots yeah right yeah. and so it's a, such a wonderful thing to know that this is a normal process this is not something to be worried about mm -mm. in your developing male voices totally totally and so i would say go with i mean i always when i work with a young singer i always say to myself it justin this is a new voice Every time you work with it, it's a new voice. So whatever we did before, throw it away. We'll take it as we take, and I try to do that with all my students though, but take it right. from the moment that you're in with them. And oh, this is what's happening today. Not what happened yesterday, not what you want to happen, but what's really happening. And I find that's very psychologically freeing because then the student doesn't feel like, oh, it's not there. It was there last time. Why isn't right. it there now? You right. Know? And especially during that time period, it's like, so let's see what's happening today. Exactly. <laughs> it's so friendly. Name it that way, yeah. you know? Yeah. It's so friendly. Like exploration. Absolutely. And then the student doesn't have to feel like intimidated when they come into a lesson. Mm -hmm. You know, that if it's based on exploration and discovery, it's they don't feel that they have to perform or they don't feel like, oh no, it's gotta all be right, it's gotta all be correct. Yeah. And there's not that anxiety of the student coming in and going, oh, gee, I hope it works today. Yeah. You know, I yeah, hope that right, I can say exactly. to the teacher. Or my teacher's going to be upset. You know? <laughs> right, right. It's like, like no, it's that's what it's doing. That's just what's happening today. Right, exactly. Because right. I guess where all of that fear and anxiety goes. <laughs> right. I know. Right there. I know. Right there. So, yeah. So, now, then, you know, obviously, then we need to try and help them bridge the right. passaggio exactly now, which I only took me 10 years barbara I know. Yes, you, oh, great okay so it took you 10 years so yeah, yeah. I, and i've this just seems to be such a, a wide variety though i have a student yeah. right now who is uh either 16 or soon to be 16 who just like has this great ability to get across you know and there's still you know obviously things he's working out but it's yeah. just pretty easy for him to kind of either choose to go up in a chest register or switch off and we hate him <laughs> and then i have another student who perhaps is i think more typical where it's like yeah. there's chest voice and then that that upper register is it's developing it's sounding good it's flexible it's open but yeah. obviously that that getting from one yeah place to the other mm -mm. <laughs> like they say in Maine you can't get there from here <laughs> yeah <laughs> yeah know? yeah exactly and I think that's where the patience comes in yeah um, and if I hadn't experienced it in my own throat I wouldn't have believed it okay. in other words yeah. if somebody hadn't if, if I hadn't really stuck the course to say okay you know what, I'm gonna have faith in this I'm gonna trust that this is gonna mm -hmm. uh, uh, bear fruit mm -hmm. I would have I would have fought against it too yeah. Because I would have thought, how is, how are you going to turn this into something different? It's not. It's not. But over time, mm -hmm. it, it absolutely, it does. It does yeah. change. The cooperation and integration of the internal uh, laryngeal muscles mm -hmm. becomes such that it there's a cooperation. Rather than yeah. the sort of antagonism, there does, does become a place of, uh, of cooperation. I t tend to, again, as you were saying earlier, bring that, let's say, adducted falsetto, once it's there, so, you know, take it all throughout the range as low as it'll go. I mean, I often tell my male students, okay, you're practicing for your counter tenor debut. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> you know, so they're like, okay, I'm doing this a lot. Mm -hmm. um, but then we we work that a lot. And then I bring it as down as low as it'll go, as low as it can possibly go, even if it's oh, on the yeah. bottom and there's nothing there. I'm like, yeah. just, just ride the pony till the wheels fall off. <laughs> and, and, uh, and they're like, okay. And then from there, what I do is I... I, I will use volume as a control factor. 
So when I'm going down, now I'm going to try to go up. But in sort of maintaining uh, some factor of control, I use volume mm -hmm. as a way to prevent the vocal folds from becoming too thick, too, you know, TA dominant, shall we say. Yeah, so um, we keep that quiet. Yes, yeah. yes. And vowel selection has a big uh, part, is a big part of that for me. So, ooh, again, in the lower part of the voice and, and bridging that gap softly and going up and down and repeating that a lot again for the for the voice and the throat to just go oh yep oh okay oh yeah we move this way this is how we move okay this is what we're doing and then you can you you set that neuromuscular pattern into practice and it's like then it's a habit and they go oh yeah i can do that that can, mm -hmm. that can happen yeah from then on i call it the seven layer cake development which is <laughs> oh i love this I you it know tasty you, i know right i mean as long as i love those good old seven layer cakes you have to sort of build the volume on it gradually so that there's a little bit more pressure, there's a little bit more vocal fold in it as we go, but again, still maintaining that smoothness of mm -hmm. transit from either yeah. side. Uh, I think you get it in a more reduced way. In fact, the, the Italians used to call it mezzo petto, half chest, mm. uh, and a mezzo falso, half falsetto. Oh. And then you sort of bring the two systems into integration. And then from there, once they work together, I will make the volumes louder, and I will also make the vowels more open. So we sort of begin to open the vocal tract and we begin to make the volume louder and test yeah. it that way. And yeah. once they can sort of do it on ah across the range, they're golden. Yeah. And if there's some dynamic control as part of that, then I know, wow, this is this is working really well. This is right. really functioning at a high level. But I think, you know, just reinforcing that it takes time oh. Oh. it takes so much time oh yes oh yes and you know especially if you're dealing with somebody who is coming out of the voice change and mm -hmm. then you know and then developing as a singer it just it takes time and you just absolutely. have to do a lot of it yes just absolutely a, a lot of it and I, again i feel like sometimes i tread softly because i'm like okay mm -hmm. we're gonna do these things and they're like Mwah. You know? mm -hmm. <laughs> yep, and yep. I'm like, no, we have to, do, we do some of this every time just to make sure that we keep picking away at it. And That's I just right. tell them it's just one of those things. It's a long-term project. Absolutely. Right? It's Absolutely. Not, no. You know. And I think while they're waiting, mm -hmm. one of the things I have found really useful is octavos. Mm -hmm. So there's a lot of really great choral literature that's written for like two part voices and or sometimes even one part where it's a very reduced range. Mm. So if you're dealing with a singer who's maybe dealing with or we're working through these issues, but maybe it's not as rangy as it could be, you can find JW Pepper is a great resource for choral music mm. that you can listen to and look at sort of the uh, range of this mm -hmm. music. And it's very poetic. It's it's lovely to sing. The melodies are pretty. Um, and so it can be really gratifying musical work while yeah. we're sort of waiting for defying gravity you know <laughs> right, right. <laughs> right well everything is in process of, yeah i think a lot of the popular contemporary music too can be somewhat supportive in the sense that it's popular right now to have that full chest and then pop into a totally. light sound every so often and that's the totally. way it's supposed to be totally and so if they enjoy that kind of music that can feel very fulfilling too because you're actually doing it the way it's supposed to be done oh, yes oh yes oh yes and and I just love the fact that it just keeps practicing them going back and forth. Yes. And even during this period of time when it's not smooth, it's not a smooth mm -hmm. register transition, but that's okay because it's genre, it's it's genre expected. Yeah. And so they can feel good about that. Totally. I tell students, if you have two good working registers, you're in a great place mm -hmm. because there's a lot of music you can sing that mm -hmm. will uh, use both of them. Maybe not yeah. in like that more connected way, but yeah. I always tell students, I'm like, the connection and the integration, that's the top of the vocal mountain. That's where we're always gonna be headed. Right. You know, along the way, you're gonna have all these new experiences and new sounds that you're gonna be able to incorporate into your singing. But, you know, ultimately we wanna get you there, but for right now, let's celebrate where this is at. And this is right. great. And there's so much material you can do and so much uh, artistic uh, expression that you can explore. Mm -hmm. It can be a really positive uh, thing for students to sort of frame it in that way. Yeah, that yeah. that it's not like, oh, your voice isn't perfect. You can't sing anything. You know, that's <laughs> right, not right. going to ever fly in a lesson. <laughs> right. But no, it is just like anything else. It's like um, the gymnast stretch or the dancers ballet stretch or anything like that. It's just continually always yeah. going to be. And I tell students, you'll do this forever. Like, yeah, <laughs> like know. you know, I, you, I'm like, it doesn't stop. You're going to keep doing this forever. I, I will right. often joke with them and I say, you know, once you get your six pack, 
you can't just be like, I'm done. I don't have to do anything ever again. I'm gonna always have my six pack. You gotta keep working and like maintain it, you know? Yeah, exactly. So maintenance exactly. work is like the work of a singer. You know, once you've right. achieved it, then you just have to maintain it and mm -hmm. keep it keep it functional. Yeah. But um. Now, yeah. so before we wrap up, like I have been seeing, and I think a lot of teachers have been singing a lot more, say, trans masculine singers. Yes. Than in the past, mm -hmm. and um, so you know, to to layer on top, people are already feeling sort of dicey about mm -hmm. dealing with with cis male voices and now someone who's trans masculine wants lessons right. and there are things that are very similar to what someone might experience in a cis male transition but there are also things that are very different and it so much depends on whether or not they're they're taking testosterone and, right. and things like that right and um you know, so I'd be interested to know, do you kind of still work in a similar way, a different way for yourself? Well, um, I try to keep it as human as possible. And I try to, again, take the voice from where it is. And huh. again, it's just always an exploration of what's happening today. What's going on in this voice? Um, Liz Jackson Hearn's book, uh, Teacher's Guide to Transgender Voices, mm, is a fantastic mm -hmm. resource yeah. to just understand physiologically what's going on, um, the, the, bio, um, the biology, the chemistry of the hormone and what that does. Mm -hmm. um, for me, it's just, um, again, taking it for every lesson by every lesson and what the student needs and, and how the instrument is progressing yeah. and and just honoring every voice, every human voice as a unique individual um, functional uh, entity mm -hmm. and honoring that and saying, OK, let's let's take it from where it is. I don't try to impose anything on it from myself yeah. in terms of function or, or in terms of aesthetic. Yeah. I just try to explore the function and, and see where it's going and 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 dialoguing with the student about what feels authentic to them? What feels yeah. most real for them? What 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 do they respond to? Uh, that goes for everyone. So yeah, it's yeah. very it transhuman in a way. It's, right, it's for everyone, right? right? Yeah. So yeah, yeah. And I think uh, it, to cycle back though a little bit about like there's that I I've ex experienced people with also that grieving process as yes. well. If people who sang well, mm. um, say in a mezzo soprano, and who uh, who that's not accessible to. Right. You know, at this time. And there's this uncertainty is that some people can come back to that and some people can't. Mm -hmm. And so there's this like uncertainty and still somewhat, even though being excited about what's coming up. Right. right. Also a sense of loss over yes. what isn't there anymore. Right. I, I hope that by keeping the upper register alive, there can yeah. still be that connection. Right. Right, that feeling, because we all have it, like we said, male, female, mm -hmm. all of us, we have it right. together. So if we can maintain that functional work up there, mm -hmm. there can still be that sound, there can still be access to that quality yeah. in yeah. a different way, but yeah. it will still be there for the singer. Right. Um, and, uh, and honoring grieving as a part of all voice work, even if you have a, yeah. a student who is, let's say, injured or, or has a, had a vocal injury, mm -hmm. you know, the thing that I find so difficult with students who have been injured is they want to sing the way they did before the injury, but the way they sang before the injury might have been the thing that got them the injury in the first place. Right. Right. So being, being able to massage them into newness, into uh, a new way of thinking about singing. I feel like there's this through, this through line for us, which really makes sense, which is teach where they are today. Yes. Right. 1000%. You can't be thinking about yesterday. You can't nope. be thinking about last year. You you have to be whether it's a developing voice, uh, you know, in a cis way, a developing voice uh, with a trans masculine singer. If it's a change to the voice from an injury, we're still dealing with absolutely. What is the voice today? Yes working the bottom but working that top mm -hmm. to get rid of the constriction yes and once the constriction releases there are so many other options absolutely and i love what you said there about take it from where you are because to me that's the essence of mindfulness when you think about mindfulness meditation the idea is you accept the situation as it's happening as it's existing at, wallet, warts and all right warts and all it's like there it is and we're gonna take it from where we are mm -hmm. um i often uh i i often talk about the envy of beauty as teachers mm. right the idea that when something doesn't work right we have this envy of beauty we think oh it needs to be this way and so sometimes we push things to be a certain way because we have this envy of beauty 
And um, acceptance to me is a much more powerful tool for change mm -hmm. than, than resistance. Full exploration of the sound. And, and in a way, to explore the male voice is to explore the female voice because both male and female voices possess masculine and feminine qualities. And I think what we're after in singing, if, if we are honoring our students, is this integration of the masculine and feminine in our students. Yeah. We want to bring both into a, a good relationship with each other. Mm -hmm. And um, a voice that is maybe skewed to one side is imbalanced. Mm -hmm. And so there may be too much. I mean, if you think about a male singer, or at least a classical singer, uh, who has a beautiful, say, rich voice, but then can diminuendo into something very sweet, it's so... There's nothing like it. I mean, it's so moving because you think, oh, and it's so sensitive and it's yeah. so exposed and it's so vulnerable. And I mean, oh, I mean, we love the loud sounds, but when you can also bring that back into that sweet, vulnerable, mm -hmm. uh, soft, cooing sound, mm -hmm. I mean, people get that's the goosebump factor. Yeah. yeah. I mean, that really is the goosebump factor for people. So I, I also think good models, good listening models are so important for male students, mm. giving them a wide variety of singers to listen to. Uh, in recording of all genres. Mm. I always encourage my students when we play recordings, I'm like, okay, we do opera, then we do country, then we do jazz. I play the gamut of styles for students to hear different types of voice use. Uh, Kurt yeah. Elling is incredible. He uses all of the capacity of his voice as a jazz singer. Mm -hmm. And so I play that for a lot of my male students or classical tenors and how they might use that beautiful mezzo voce half voice singing that's so beautiful. Mm. Um, they get a gamut of stuff. So Having good role models to listen to can also be a real inspiration for young male singers. As that's well. a good idea. Yeah, that's good too. And have it the variety, like you said. I feel like sometimes, uh, if if they're if they enjoy contemporary commercial music, they're listening to only one style. If yes. they're um, listening to musical theater, well, musical theater goes through styles based mm -hmm. on when it is, and you see here only a certain range or only a certain voice type. It seems for a decade, and then next right. thing you know, then it's something else, right? Right, and then it's new. Right. And it's always high, high, higher, highest, highest, highest right, possible. Right, high. Exactly. <laughs> it, it's, it's really hard for me to find repertoire for these developing voices because you know they're all singing up in in A four, and, and I'm like, yeah. my developing singer. No. Even if eventually there might be a tenor, they're not there now. No, my poor little kidlets. They're like, what do I do? I love this musical style so much, but I can't sing it. Yeah, I know. And I'm like, oh boy, oh boy. So that's where I I pull out the folk music. You know, I pull a lot of folk music out. I pull some of those octavos out. Yeah. I try to find really beautiful melodies that are like the musical theater songs that they're listening to. Mm -hmm. And again, I'm going to keep, I'm, I'm not getting paid sponsorship. It's, <laughs> but like J.W. Pepper is fantastic because you can go and you can listen to a lot of these songs yeah. and be like, oh, this would be perfect for my lower male voice uh, student um, to sing. Um, so giving them sort of a, a wide repertoire to listen to is so important because they might find a jazz song that they really connect yeah. with or they might even find a country song i always tell people country um, low male voices tend to find their happiest homes in country music classical singing or even gospel singing mm -hmm. it seems to be that musical theater tends to favor that boyish high yeah that's true sound that, i hadn't thought of it that way but yeah yeah i, I agree yeah so again it's um always for me it's always about the the, the, the rich buffet of musical yeah. repertoire What's out there? What can you listen to? And there's so much great music. And I if I can get excited, and if I can get them excited about it, because I have found that in my life, the artists that I love and have read about their accounts of their biographies have said, I was inspired by this random artist that is totally not even in my vocal musical style, but I saw what they did and it just blew my mind. And I just right. was, it changed my life. So I always keep telling my students, you know, keep your eyes open for where inspiration will lead you in singing because yes you may not sing that type of music but maybe the directness of that artist's approach or the expression that they use or the the authenticity that they sing with may be something that just blows your mind and says oh that's how i want to be in the world in my style of music so yeah well thank yeah. you so much yeah. it, was fun. it was fun i really love chatting absolutely about this stuff and and you know it, I'm hoping that it's going to be really informative for some people, like just yeah. take down that stress level. Totally. You know? Yeah. And it doesn't have to be stressful. It's, you yeah. know, it doesn't have to be um, just and the, the key that we have to remember is patience. Yes. Because when we get impatient, that's when we get stressed yes. because we feel like we're trying to put mother nature on a timeline. And I'm like, well, talk to the trees about growing and see how they feel about it. <laughs> uh, <thank you. laughs> Back to that cultivation versus production. Exactly. You know, exactly. And, and that, that 
is a nice thing to, to come back around to because of production, right? You think yes. assembly line, you think I take these parts and I put them all together and I can right. make whatever I want, but exactly. But the voice, you don't know what, you know, like it, it's in development. The, right. the parts are changing and totally. you know, might be on back order. No, <laughs> exactly. Right. Well, yes, exactly. I always tell students like when they have the two functional uh, registers, I'm like, oh great, we don't have to order in. We don't have to order any parts. <laughs> Exactly. Yeah, it's all here, it's right? here. The parts are here. Yes, exactly. I'm so excited. Right. But no, it's so much of our work is is in, at least in a cultivation sense is in observation and watching, mm -hmm. and tending and watching and tending. Yeah. Rather than making. Providing sunlight, yes. water. Yes. Yes. And, yes. and and I tell there. people all the time that 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 environment is the vocal exercise. The vocal exercise is an environment that you put the voice mm -hmm. into, and it will either be congenial or not to the voice, but you got to be able to be sensitized to noticing that, Yeah, you know, oh, this isn't congenial. This, the, the plant is rejecting this particular right. thing. Don't do it. Don't do yeah. it. Um, and, and it's also the psychiatric uh, environment, you know, the treatment of the student, how we are at the piano, how we are in the, in the room with them. That's part of the environment as well. Will they develop in an environment where they're welcomed and, and uh, right. greeted with, you know, compassion and dignity, or will we sort of be that sort of old school didactic, you know, taskmaster. Yeah, that, that doesn't work for me. <laughs> not for a lot of people. And their bodies rebel too. So right, right. I'm afraid of my teacher. Probably not a good thing. <laughs> yeah, Probably right. not a good thing. That, that might not be. I want to go with that. <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, cultivate, cultivate and enjoy the process. Mm -hmm. And nature will reward you. I always tell people nature will reward us. We just have to wait. We just right. have to wait. Yeah. yeah. Great. Well, thank Yay. you so much. Absolutely.